So uh, Bart Ehrman is the author of more than 20 books, including the New York Times bestselling Misquoting Jesus, God's Problem, and Jesus Interrupting. He is the James A. Gray Distinguished, Distinguished Professor of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and is a leading authority on the Bible and the life of Jesus. He has been featured in Time and has appeared on NBC Dateline, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, The Colbert Report, CNN, History Channel, and other top media outlets. And I found it very amusing that The Daily Show and The Colbert Report was then followed by other top media outlets. <laughs> and he lives in Durham, North Carolina. So please join me in welcoming Bart Aaron. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, for, uh, thanks for coming out. So uh, this, uh, this talk is based on uh, the book that I just uh, did, that I'm doing a little bit of a book tour on. Uh, the book is called Forged, uh, Writing in the Name of God, Why the uh, Bible's Authors Are Not Who We Think They Are. And uh, so the talk will be involving that. Right, might help if I turned on the mic. Uh, OK, yes, that's working better. Good, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm. Uh, I'm on this book tour in the midst of teaching full time. I'm teaching at the University of North Carolina. And at the University of North Carolina, most of my students come from very conservative evangelical churches uh, because it's the Bible Belt. And so uh, when, I, when I start teaching my class, as I did this semester, I have a, I have a large, pretty large class, 180 students in it. And I begin my class after handing out the syllabus and explaining that this class is not like a church. Uh, this is not a Sunday school. I'm not a preacher or an evangelist. I'm a historian. And this class will be taught from a historical perspective. Uh, so the New Testament, not as a book of faith, which it is, of course, but the New Testament as a, as a, as a document situated in history. And so this will be a different approach. I tell them from what they're what they're used to if they've uh, been to church, which most of them have. So uh, once I turn out the syllabus on the very first day of class, uh, the first thing I do is I give them a pop quiz, which they think is a little bit odd because I haven't taught them anything yet. <laughs> but I give them a pop quiz. And uh, part of the reason for the pop quiz is uh, I want to know how much they know about the New Testament before I start teaching. And I also want them to know how much they know about the New Testament. And so that's the point of the quiz. Uh, so this quiz has 11 questions on it. And uh, I begin by telling them that if anyone in the room can get eight out of the 11 right, I'll buy them dinner at the Armadillo Grill. Uh, so uh, this year, uh, my 180 students, I bought one dinner. Uh, because my students are more committed to the Bible than knowledgeable about the Bible. And so you know, it's actually not that hard of a not that hard of a quiz. So the, the first question on the quiz is, uh, how many books are in the New Testament? Well, that's kind of basic information that you think if somebody studied the New Testament you know, for 19 years, they would know. But in fact, my students don't know. The, the answer, as it turns out, is pretty easy. The answer is 27. And uh, the reason that's easy is because when you think about the New Testament, you think about God. You think about God. You think about the Christian God. The Christian God, you think Trinity. And what is 27? Three to the third power. So uh, you know it's it's a miracle. <laughs> so uh, so then the next question is: In what language were these books written? Now uh, this one really stumps a lot of my students. About half of my students think that the answer is Hebrew, and I've, I've never quite figured that out. But I think it's because uh, when you watch all these uh, Jesus documentaries on History Channel, Discovery Channel, they're always flashing up Hebrew texts back behind. And so people naturally think Hebrew, Jesus, and, and, but that's wrong. Uh, normally only four or five of my students think that the answer is English. <laughs> uh, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, the, the right answer is Greek, as it turns out. Uh, because Greek was the lingua franca of the Roman Empire. It's what everybody spoke. Just like today, you go to Europe and you need to get around in Germany or France or Italy. If you speak English, pretty much you can get around. In, in the Roman Empire, if you spoke Greek, you could pretty well get around. And so people who wanted to communicate broadly would write, uh, would write in Greek. And so these books are all written in Greek. So these are the kinds of questions I ask, basic factual information. I, I, mean, I do throw in, throw in a few curveballs. 
uh, because I don't want to buy any dinners. <laughs> and so uh, one of my curveballs is I ask, uh, what was the Apostle Paul's last name? <laughs> well, right, somebody will always say, of Tarsus, <laughs> uh, Saul of Tarsus. But uh, the, the, the point is, people in the ancient world didn't have last names uh, unless they were upper crust, elite, Roman aristocracy, you know, then they had lots of names. But if they were just a normal person, they just had one name, uh, which is why in the New Testament you have all these people with the same name. Uh, and when people have the same name, then they give some kind of identifying feature to, to let you know which one they're talking about. So you have all these Marys in the New Testament. So they, they're always identified. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary of Bethany. Mary Magdalene. See, these are all identifiers because they didn't have other ways of identifying because they didn't have last names. And I have to teach my students that because they naturally assume that Jesus Christ, you know, <laughs> Christ is you know his last name. So, but I have to tell you, you know, it's not Jesus Christ born to Joseph and Mary Christ. You know, it's, uh, it's just uh, it's an identifying. Feature Christ means Messiah, so it's saying Jesus is the Messiah. So anyway, so my, my students don't know basic information about the Bible, even though they believe it, let alone scholarship about the Bible. And so the class is really about scholarship on the Bible, which they know absolutely nothing about because they've never heard any of this stuff in church, even though in many cases their pastors will have known it because the pastors got trained in places to teach this kind of thing. One of the things that, that my students don't know about is uh, what I'm talking with you about for the next 20 minutes or so, uh, uh, which is uh, that there are books in the New Testament that claim to be written by people who did not write them. Now, in the modern world, if somebody writes a book claiming to be someone famous when they're not that person, we call that a forgery. Uh, and what I argue in my book, Forged, is that ancient people also thought negatively of this kind of literary activity. They also thought it was a form of lying and deceit, and they didn't accept it. Uh, and I try and show why it is that scholars nonetheless think that there are books in the New Testament who were not, that were not written by the people called, who were named as their authors. So I want to talk about that. That's the main topic I want to talk about. But to get there, I want to talk about, to kind of set the stage, by talking about a couple books that did not make it into the New Testament. A couple books that didn't make it in, which are absolutely forgeries. So the first, uh, the first example I want to talk about is a gospel that allegedly is written by Jesus' disciple Simon Peter, the Gospel of Peter. This book uh, was lost for centuries, uh, was not discovered until 1886. There was, a, there was a French archaeological team that was working out of Cairo, Egypt, that was digging in, in a different part of Egypt. It's, about, it, it's a place called Akhmim. It's about halfway down the Nile in Egypt. And um, in Akhmim, they were digging up a cemetery. And in this cemetery, these archaeologists uncovered a tomb of somebody they thought was a monk. They thought he was a monk because he was buried with a sacred book. And it's this book that I'm interested in. This book is a 66-page book that uh, contains four documents. So it's a, it's a kind of uh, anthology, ancient anthology of texts, four texts in it. The first one is this one that I'm calling the Gospel of Peter. The first ten pages uh, <coughs> give this Gospel of Peter, but they don't give the entire thing. We don't have the whole Gospel of Peter. We, we, uh, the, the book actually begins in the middle of a sentence. So this is a fragment of the Gospel of Peter. Uh, what I mean by that is, I don't mean that this book that we have is itself a fragment. Uh, it's an entire book. The first page is blank. Second page, there's a cross drawn on it. The third page, at the top of the page, in the upper left-hand side, it begins, but it begins in the middle of a sentence. So the scribe who is copying this book, probably in the 6th century, the 6th century scribe who copied this book was copying what was a fragment. Okay. So the book isn't a fragment, he was copying a fragment. The book begins with these words. And none of the Jews wanted to wash their hands, so Pilate stood up. Now, uh, that calls to mind a passage found in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew, where uh, Jesus is put on trial before Pontius Pilate, and, uh, and Pilate declares Jesus innocent, and to show that he thinks Jesus is innocent, 
he washes his hands in front of the crowd and says, I'm innocent of this man's blood. And the crowd, the Jewish crowd cries out, his blood be upon us and our children. So the Jewish crowd is taking responsibility for the death of Jesus. This is the verse that was used for all of the <coughs> hateful anti-Semitic purposes over the, over the centuries. The Gospel of Peter doesn't have that verse, but it does have a verse not found in Matthew, which is, none of the Jews wanted to wash their hands. Well, what happens in this, in this account of Jesus' death is that the Jews are far more guilty for Jesus' death, even than they are in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, the Jews are more culpable in the death of Jesus. And so that's one of the themes in this Gospel of, this gospel of Peter. It's a very anti-Jewish form of the Gospel. Uh, it is an account of Jesus uh, going on uh, trial, being condemned, being crucified, and then being raised from the dead, which, of course, is an account that you get in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament as well. But in this account, there are many differences from the others. The most stark difference comes at the very end. The Gospel of Peter, unlike the other Gospels that we have, do not... Uh, the, the, gospel, the Gospel of Peter narrates an account of Jesus being raised from the dead. And they well, wait, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John narrate Jesus being raised from the dead, right? No, they don't. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is crucified, he's dead, and then he's buried. Three day, on the third day, the women go to the tomb and they find the tomb empty. In other words, Jesus has been raised from the dead, but you're not given a story of it happening. There's no story of Jesus coming out of the tomb. But there is a story like that in the Gospel of Peter. And it's a terrific story. What happens is, according to this Gospel of Peter, uh, the authorities set a guard at the tomb of Jesus to make sure nobody comes to steal the body. And as the guard is guarding the tomb, they look up and they see the heavens rip open. And two angelic beings descend from heaven. And as they descend from heaven, the stone in front of the tomb rolls away by itself. They come down, they enter into the tomb, and then as the guard is watching, three people come out of the tomb. Two of them are so tall that their head reaches up to the sky. The third is so tall that they're supporting him. His head reaches up above the sky. And after they come out of the tomb, Behind them from the tomb emerges the cross. And a voice comes from heaven and says, Have you preached to those who are asleep? And the cross replies, Yes. <laughs> so, here we have a giant Jesus and a walking, talking cross. <laughs> How this thing got lost for centuries, I don't know. You'd think this would be one you'd want to keep, but, but it eventually got lost. Well, uh, so, so it's, it, the whole thing is metaphorical, of course. I mean, the, the reason these two angels are as tall as skyscrapers is because they're angels. They're superhuman. And so superhumans are really big. And Jesus is taller than them because he's even more superhuman. He's the son of God. And so he's really tall. And the cross walking out, uh, that's a metaphor for... Uh, the, the question is, did, did the message of the cross of Jesus go to those who were already dead? Have you preached to those who are asleep? The answer being yes. G the message of Jesus' salvation on the cross has gone even to those who died before Jesus came on earth. And so it's a theological statement <coughs> expressed through a metaphor. All right, well, one of the other interesting features of this Gospel of Peter is what happens at the very end. Because at the end, the author identifies himself. The last verse of the Gospel of Peter says this. I, Simon Peter, and my brother Andrew decided to go fishing. And with us went Levi, the son of Alphaeus, whom the Lord... And that's where it stops. <laughs> so it stops right in the middle of the sentence. And so you're not sure exactly what's going to happen next, but it looks like what's going to happen next is they're going to go fishing, they're going to see Jesus raised from the dead and, and have a conversation with him, we guess. But it stops there. But for my purposes, the interesting thing is the author identifies himself. I, Simon Peter. That's striking because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament are written by authors who do not identify themselves. The, the Gospels in the New Testament are anonymous. Only later, people said, oh yeah, this one's written by Matthew. This one's written by Mark. This one's by Luke. And then later, scribes put in titles of the Gospel according to Matthew. 
But there's nothing in Matthew to think that Matthew wrote it. Uh, there's no first-person narrative. Never, the author never says, you know, one day Jesus came up to me and we went to Jerusalem and we did this, that, or the other. It's all the third-person narrative. Not the Gospel of Peter, though. The Gospel of Peter is written by somebody claiming to be Peter. But this Gospel was certainly written sometime in the early 2nd century, at least 60 years after Peter was dead. This is somebody claiming to be Peter knowing full well he wasn't Peter. In other words, it's somebody lying about his identity. In the ancient world, they would call that kind of writing a lie, a pseudos. In modern terms, we would call it a forgery, somebody claiming to be someone other than he was. New Testament scholars have long claimed that this kind of literary activity of claiming to be someone other than who you were was both widespread and acceptable in the ancient world. Uh, one of the things I tried to show in my book is that, in fact, it was widespread, but it was not acceptable. Ancient people said very nasty things about this kind of literary activity. They didn't approve of it. They thought it was deceitful, deceitful and they, they, they weren't in support of it. So, uh, okay, so that's the Gospel of Peter. Uh, I'll give you a second example uh, from outside the New Testament of a book allegedly written by Peter. This time it's called The Apocalypse of Peter. The Apocalypse of Peter, as it turns out, is also in this 66-page book that these archaeologists discovered in Egypt. In some ways, the Apocalypse of Peter is more interesting even than the Gospel of Peter. The Apocalypse of Peter is the first instance we have of somebody being given a guided tour of heaven and hell. So uh, you, you, you probably know about this idea of the guided tour of heaven and hell from Dante's Divine Comedy. Well, Dante didn't make up the idea of the guided tour of heaven and hell. Uh, it's, it's an old motif that goes way back in Christianity, and the earliest instance we have of it is here in this Apocalypse of Peter. In the Apocalypse of Peter, it's Peter himself who is given a first-hand account, who gives a first-hand account of this uh, guided tour of heaven and hell. Uh, Peter is given a tour by Jesus himself to show him the realms of the blessed and the realms of the damned. Now, the interesting thing about the Gospel of Peter is that like a lot of other guided tours of heaven and hell, the description of the realms of the blessed of heaven are really not all that interesting. And the reason is because there's only so many ways you can describe eternal bliss. <laughs> I mean, people in heaven are happy. You know, blessed are the saints in the heavenly realm. Yay, blessed are they. Oh, happy, blessed are the saints. Yay, joyful, blessed, happy are they. I mean, they're happy. It's great. They're in heaven. I mean, how good can it get? It's as good as it gets. It's great. So, you know, the description is not all that interesting. But if you have any creative imagination at all, and want to describe the torments of the damned, you can come up with some really interesting uh, accounts, and that's what happens here. Uh, so the, the descriptions of the realms of the damned are, are much more interesting, and uh, what happens in the realms of the damned is that many people are punished according to their characteristic sin. So whatever, whatever was their characteristic sin while alive, that's how they're punished after death. And so Peter sees a place where, uh, where the blasphemers are being published, punished. And they're being punished by uh, being hanged by their tongues over eternal flames because they lied against God. And so they use their tongues against God. So they're hanged by their tongues over eternal flame. It goes to another place. And the women who braided their hair to make themselves attractive to seduce men are hanged by their hair over eternal flames. The men they seduced are hanged by a different body part <laughs> over eternal flames. And in this case, the men cry out, we didn't know it would come to this, <laughs> as you can well imagine. So, so you, get the, you get this description of the realms of the blessed, the realms of the damned, and it claims to be written by, by Peter himself. Uh, the point of the, the account is pretty obvious. If you want to uh, enjoy the blessings of heaven and avoid the torments of hell, then don't sin. Okay, so I mean, it's... You know, that's just kind of a simple lesson. But here again, we have an instance of a book that claims to be written by Simon Peter, Jesus' right-hand man, the, the main disciple, his head disciple. 
But it certainly was not written by Peter. It wasn't written until the second century, 60, 70 years, 80 <coughs> years after Peter was dead. Somebody claiming to be Peter who wasn't. These are not the only two books that we have from early Christianity that claim to be written by Peter. We have, other, we have letters allegedly written by Peter. We have three other, three other uh, apocalypses that claim to be written by Peter. Writing books in the name of Peter was something of a cottage industry in early Christianity. Is it possible that books written in the name of Peter made it into the New Testament? Well, as it turns out, there is there are two books that claim to be written in the New Testament by Peter, First and Second Peter. I'm going to argue in a minute Peter, that Peter didn't write those either. And I'm going to argue that there are other forgeries in the New Testament, books that claim to be written by somebody who did not, in fact, write them. First, let me say something about the prominence of forgery in antiquity broadly. As it turns out, it was a wide phenomenon. It did happen a lot in the ancient world, more than happens today. It still happens today. People still write forgeries today. Uh, but it, it's easier to detect forgeries today because we have all sorts of technologies and handwriting analyses and stylistic analyses. We have better ways of being able to detect forgery now than they had back then, and so people practiced it a lot more back then. But people did practice it back then. We know this because ancient people actually talk about it. And in almost every case that they say something about forgery, they condemn it. Because people didn't like it back then any more than you would like it today if somebody published a, a letter or a book in your name claiming to be you when they weren't you. Well, they didn't like it in the ancient world either. Let me, ex let me give a couple of uh, anecdotes to explain how ancient people thought about forgery. The first involves a non-Christian. Just to show you that this phenomenon happened in the it happened in the Roman world, it happened in the Greek world, it happened among the Jews, it happened among the Christians. Forgery was a widespread phenomenon. Give you a non-Christian example, a Roman example, a guy named Galen. Galen was a very famous author in the second Christian century. He was a doctor, a medical man, who wrote a lot of books. Uh, in one of his books, Galen gives an autobiographical account in which he indicates that one day he was walking through a street in Rome and he was passing by a bookseller shop. And in the bookseller shop, there were two men arguing over a book. One, this book, allegedly, was written by Galen. So Galen's overhearing this conversation about a book that he allegedly wrote. One guy's arguing that this is a book I just bought from Galen. And, it, and the other guy's arguing, this book isn't written by Galen. He read the first two lines. He said, this book, the writing style's all wrong. Well, that warmed the cockles of Galen's heart because he, in fact, had not written the book. So he went home that afternoon, and he did write a book. And we have that book still today. It's sometimes called How to Recognize Books Written by Galen. <laughs> so, because you know, Galen didn't like the idea of people doing this. So uh, I'll give you a second example to show you how forgery was talked about, <coughs> talked about in, the, uh, in the ancient times. Uh, this time a Christian book. There's a book called the Apostolic Constitutions. It's a book that scholars can date pretty precisely uh, for, because of things inside of it to around the year 380. So uh, just to set you on the timeline, so if Jesus died around the year 30, most of the New Testament books were written between a say between 50 and 100. This book is written around the year 380. So it's 300 years after most of the apostles were dead. It claims, though, to be written by the apostles. It's called the Apostolic Constitutions because it describes how the church is to be constituted. Who should your leaders be? What should their big qualifications be? What should they do? How do you perform the baptism ceremony? How do you perform the Eucharist? How do you do things? And um, it's written in the name of the 12 apostles after Jesus' death. So whoever wrote is claiming to be the apostles. And sometimes he speaks in the first person. I, Peter, say to you this. I, Andrew, say to you this. I, John, say to you this. As if these people are actually talking. Even though these people have been dead for 300 years. At the end of the book, near the end of the book, is a really interesting exhortation. Near the end of the book, the author tells his readers that they should not read books that claim to be written by apostles but aren't. 
You're like, wait a second, why would he say that? That's what he's doing. He's writing a book that's claiming to be, but that's not. Well, he's doing it because his reader won't suspect him of doing what he condemns. In other words, he's trying to throw his reader off the scent of his own deceit. So the question is, how widely was forgery condemned in the ancient world? Forgery was condemned in books that are forged. That's how widely it was condemned. Uh, just about everybody condemned the practice. So are there forgeries in the New Testament? Scholars have widely thought that there are books that are not written by the alleged authors in the New Testament. Scholars have been reluctant to call these things forgeries. Uh, scholars tend to call these things pseudepigrapha. Uh, pseudepigrapha is spelled with a P in the front, pseudepigrapha. Uh, P-S-E-U, pseudepigrapha. They, uh, they call them this because they don't want to call them forgeries. Uh, and if you call them pseudepigrapha, it's a much more antiseptic ter antiseptic term. They don't tell you what the word pseudepigrapha means. What it means is writings that are inscribed with a lie. So it's really not much better than forgery, but it doesn't sound as bad. And so they call them the pseudepigrapha. Uh, scholars have long known, for example, that whoever wrote 2 Peter, it was not Peter. There are debates about 1 Peter. A lot of scholars think Peter wrote 1 Peter, and I'm not one of them. Uh, doing my research for this book, I decided there's no way Peter wrote 1 Peter or 2 Peter and for a very simple reason. Peter could not write. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, there have been interesting studies of literacy in the ancient world that have shown uh, that most people were, were completely illiterate in the ancient world. At the best of times in the ancient world, maybe 10% of the population could read. In Roman Palestine, where Peter grew up, the literacy rate, by the best studies, has put it somewhere around 3%. That's of the people who can read. Fewer people can write than can read. Because reading and writing are actually separate exercises, even though we learned them together. In the ancient world, they taught them separately. So to be able to write, you had to be really highly educated. And so who are these 3%? They're the upper crust, very wealthy elite who are living in cities where they have schools. And who was Peter? Peter, according to the New Testament, was a lower class fisherman from rural Galilee who spoke Aramaic. Well, 1 Peter is written in highly rhetorical Greek. Was Peter somebody who would have gotten an education? No way. He probably was a fisherman, probably fished from the time he was a young boy. Didn't have time for school, had no money, wasn't in a place where they had schools. So Peter did not write 1 Peter. I mean, unless, I mean, the only option is that, you know, after the resurrection, maybe Peter decided to go back to school. And so he took classes at the Capernaum High School. And for his foreign language class, he decided, required, he decided to take Greek. And so he got pretty good at Greek. And then at the end of his life, he learned Greek composition, took some composition courses so that he could write First Peter. I mean, it's possible. But, you know, people like Peter had other things on their mind besides writing, besides learning Greek composition. I, did, I don't think Peter wrote First Peter right? because I don't think he was literate. Uh, by the way, the New Testament says that Peter was illiterate. Acts chapter 4, verse 13, literally says that he could not read. So, well, you know, I think he didn't. And I don't think that he told somebody else to write the letter for him, which is the solution a lot of scholars have come up with, that Peter told some scribe, well, write a book for me, you know, and say this, and the guy wrote it down. We have no examples of that happening in the ancient world that, are, that can plausibly be applied to Peter. Whereas we have lots of examples of what I think is going on here, which is somebody later who wants you to think he's Peter, and so he claims to be Peter, so you'll read his book. It's probably somebody who had no reputation, nobody knew who he was, and he couldn't very well write a book in his own name because nobody would read it. So he wrote his book, and he claimed to be Peter, so people would read it, and he was highly successful. The thing ended up in the New Testament. I mean, that's about <laughs> as successful as you can get. Uh, so First and Second Peter probably were not written by Peter. Um, there are 13 letters that claim to be written by Paul in the New Testament. 13 letters that claim to be written by Paul. Scholars are pretty sure that Paul did not write six of them. Six of them are not really written by Paul, but by people later claiming to be written by Paul. What I argue in my book, uh, oh, by the way, yeah, with Paul, we're in a better situation than with Peter. Paul could write. You know, we've got seven letters from him. But if you've got seven letters from somebody and you've got some other letter you're not sure about, all you have to do is to compare it with the seven. 
and you look at the writing style, the vocabulary, the theology that's in it, the, the historical situation that's presupposed, when you do that, these other six don't match up to the seven very well, and so it's probable that the same author did not produce them. So you get, you get six letters that are not really by Paul. I would call those forgeries. Two letters by Peter I would call forgeries. The book of James is almost certainly not written by the brother of Jesus, James. Jude was certainly not written by Jesus' brother, Jude. Uh, so there, there are probably 10, 11, or 12 books in the New Testament that are forgeries. That's out of 27, over a third of the books. So it's a significant problem. Let me just uh, conclude by just saying a word about what might have been motivating these people to write forgeries. Because it's a special problem within early Christianity. It's a problem because Christians insisted that God was truth, that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life, that you had to believe the truth if you're going to be right with God, that as a Christian you should speak the truth to one another. And so why would an author who believed that the truth was important, why would he lie about who he was? So the reality is we'll never know what was motivating these people, but I do have a guess that I think is a pretty good guess, um, which is this. There were people in the ancient world, just as there are people today, who thought that there are some situations in which it was the right thing to do to tell a lie. That sometimes it's right to lie. You yourself can imagine situations where a lie is the appropriate thing to do. In the ancient world, people like Plato said, if a doctor has to lie to his patient in order to get her to take his medicine, to, to, to take her medicine, that's a good thing. That's a good lie. Or if a general is in battle and his troops are getting beaten and he needs to rally them, it's okay to lie to them to say that reinforcements are coming so that they'll fight more valiantly. That's a good lie. There are places where it's appropriate and good to lie. It may be that there were ancient authors who thought that their views of this Christian religion were so spot on and so important and really needed to be widely accepted that it was so important to get this message out that they were willing to claim to be someone that they weren't. They were willing to write a book and claim to be Peter or Paul or John or Matthew or, or Judas or Mary and so forth. It's possible that they thought that this lie was justified because of the importance of their message. If so, then we have this very interesting irony that some early Christian authors thought that in order to convey the truth, it was appropriate to tell a lie. Thank you very much. I can take questions if anybody has any. Yes? Do you have any theories about the mechanism by which this happens? I'm trying to, I <clears throat> want a lot of people to read a letter that I claim comes from Peter. Do yes. I send it by mail and uh, say, hey, I dug this up from somewhere, it looks uh -huh. interesting, yeah. maybe, you know, it claims to be from Peter, maybe it is, but I don't know where it came from. Yeah. What do you think? Or what, what would? Yeah, think? right, right. So there are various mechanisms that we know about. Um, there might be some that we don't know about, but we do know about some. One involves what you alluded to, the idea of a discovery, that you discover something. And so the most, the, the most interesting instance of this is in a, an apocalypse, which is you know, a revelation from God that comes directly to a person in an apocalypse. An apocalypse of Paul, uh, where Paul, Paul is taken up into heaven and he sees the heavenly world and he describes it for his readers. Uh, this book claims to be written by Paul, but again, it's from the 4th century. Uh, it was is written near the end of the 4th century, so probably 320 years after Paul is dead. But it claims to be written by Paul. So the author, though, had this problem that he, he wrote this thing at the end of the 4th century. Nobody had ever heard of it before, and he wanted to put it in circulation, but people would ask, you know, where's it been? I mean, this... So he actually begins the narrative with a discovery narrative, in which he says that there was a man who was living in the city of Tarsus, Paul's town, uh, in the end of the fourth century, who actually lived in Paul's old house. And one night he had a dream. An angel came to him in a dream and told him to dig up the foundations of the house. And he ignored the angel. Second night, the angel comes back, tells him to dig up the foundations of the house. He ignores him. Third night, angel comes back, beats him to a bloody <laughs> pulp, and tells him to dig up the foundations of the house. 
And so he does. He goes down, he digs up the foundations of the house, and he finds a box, a marble box that is sealed with lead. And so uh, he doesn't know what to do with it. He takes it to the local governor, explains what happened. The governor doesn't want to touch it, takes it to the Roman emperor. The Roman emperor opens it up, and there's a book inside of it. And here's the book. And so, so, and so this explains where the thing has been for the last 300 years. It's been buried in the foundations of this house. So sometimes you get a discovery narrative. You don't get that very often, but sometimes and they're great when you get them. The more common thing, I think, was a couple things to, a couple things to bear in mind. First, uh, there is no postal service, uh, so you can't just kind of send in the mail someplace. The way things, and second of all, there's no mass production of books. So, uh, you know, you, somebody writes a book, and the only way to get a copy is for somebody else to copy it out by hand one letter at a time. So it takes a long time for things to get copied out. And it takes a long time for things to circulate. And so if you don't know of something that was written 10 years ago, that doesn't seem odd any longer. You know, it's not like if, um, you know, if Dan Brown, all of a sudden a book shows up that Dan Brown published 20 years ago and nobody ever heard of it. If it was, you know, Dan Brown did not really publish that. But, but, but back then, you know, if a letter of Paul shows up 20 years later, that's not that unusual because there's not mass, you know, there aren't, there aren't, there aren't huge, uh, you know, Barnes and Noble selling these things and stuff. So um, what you would do, suppose you, um, suppose you want to claim to be Paul and you're writing a letter uh, in which you're embracing your views. You address it to a church, say you address it to the church of Thessalonica and you maybe make a few copies of it and you, you give them to travelers and you say, you know, uh, we have this shirt, we have this letter that we've gotten from, uh, you know, in circulation here, take this, to, they take it to Rome, somebody else takes it to Jerusalem, somebody else takes it to Alexandria, Egypt. But what you don't do is you, you don't write it and then send it to the church in Thessalonica because they, they know they never got this letter. So you send it, you know, send it and it starts circulating and years later when everybody's dead who would know better, you know, there it is. So that's the mechanism probably. Yeah. Beyond forgery, as you described, there are a lot of contradictions in the New Testament, including the main um, evangels. So is there anything good in it? Is there anything <laughs> good in the New Testament? <laughs> uh, there's a lot of good stuff in the New Testament. No, the New Testament's terrific. Uh, it's terrific. You know, it's, um, the New Testament is filled with really interesting stories. For people who are religious, it's been the basis of the Christian religion for you know 2,000 years. And so... Uh, it, it has uh, terrific stuff in it. It has terrific moral teachings in it. No, no, I'm just, you know, the, the philology of the book, you know, uh, some stuff is forged, some stuff is just, you know, self-inconsistent. Yes, there are inconsistencies. There, there, are, uh, there are writings that are written by people who claim to be writing them. I mean, the, the seven letters of Paul, for example. Uh, Paul's seven letters are uh, really written by him, and they're important historically because they can tell us what was going on at a certain point of time within Christianity. So there, it's, the, the New Testament is extremely valuable historically. For many people, it's valuable religiously, and I think it contains a lot of important ethical teaching. But you're absolutely right. There are a lot of contradictions as well, because different authors had different points of view. I think the problem with the New Testament is that people have taken it as a divine book, and that doesn't hold up under scrutiny because of the contradictions, because of the forgeries, that it's, it's not... I don't think you can take it as the inerrant revelation from God, because it's not that. It's a very human book. But as human books go, it's really fantastic, in my opinion. Yeah? You say in a, a lot of the stuff you've been talking about, you know, the, you quote various dates that the, the various books were written. How do you actually arrive at those dates? How do you yeah. know, you know the four Gospels were written between, you know, 50 and 100. Yeah, right, yeah, right. It's complicated, but, you know, there, there are scholars who spend years trying to figure this kind of stuff out. So, I mean, there are actually scholarship involved. Uh, give you the short story with the Gospels. When you have an anonymous text that's a historical narrative, um, there are two big things that you're looking for. One thing you're looking for is a reference to some historical event that you can otherwise date, a reference in the text to something that you know when it happened. Okay, so if you, if you find some letter today that shows up that mentions uh, Obama's inauguration, then you know that it had to be written after a certain date, right? So, uh, so that's one thing you look for. The other thing you look for 
is some some author whom you can absolutely date with with precision who quotes a book. So if you get those two things, you get the time after which it had to be written and the time before which it had to be written. So you get a, you get a range. Um, with the Gospels, there are certain things that are ab that you can say with absolute certainty. For example, the Gospels all talk about Pontius Pilate. We know that Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea between 26 and 36 of the Common Era from other historical records. So the Gospels are written after 36, or you know, sometime after the 30s. Um, there is a reference in the Gospel of Luke to Jerus the city of Jerusalem being surrounded by Gentile troops and being trampled down by the Gentiles and the temple being destroyed. Well, we know when that happened. It happened in the year 70. So Luke was probably written sometime after the year 70. Luke gets quoted in the early 2nd century by church fathers we can date. So it's sometime before the early 2nd century. So you, you see, you start narrowing it down like that. that so that, that's basically how you do it. Yeah? Um, any guesses about who was doing this? Because like you said, the literacy rate was so... Rare. Yeah. So was it clergy members? Yeah. Was it the elite? Was it yeah. officials? Yeah, who's doing it? Right. And how much of it is a conspiracy? Yeah. All <laughs> uh, right. So um, so we we don't know. When we have something like well, the six letters of Paul that weren't really written by Paul, three of them were written by the same guy. That can be shown on literary linguistic grounds. That the same person wrote first and second Timothy and Titus. Um, but we don't know who he is. What we do know about him is that he's a Greek-speaking Christian who's a follower of Paul, who's living outside of Palestine, and usually he's dated to about 20 or 30 years later, but this is a case where it's hard to know. It might be 40 or 50 years later. I mean, it's hard to get a date. Um, he is very concerned with the correct organization of the church, which might suggest that, in fact, he's a leader of a church himself. Because he, he lays out what the qualifications of the leaders ought to be, what the duties of the leaders ought to be. And so it seems that that's one of his vested interests, so maybe he's a church leader. So, um, so that's about all you can say. is a Greek-speaking, highly educated, Greek-speaking uh, Christian who is an admirer of Paul, living outside of Palestine, who is particularly interested in the church, probably a bishop of the church someplace. So you can do that kind of thing with most of these books. But you can't ever say, uh, yeah, it was Jehoshaphat. You know, you know this guy who lived in Syria or something. You know, we don't have any names. Yeah. Uh, you keep saying you're certain about uh, some that aren't written or I guess forged, and then you're, you keep saying these seven books by Paul that you know are certain. How? What is? What but, makes you so certain about these seven? Yeah. Why be certain about the seven? So, the seven are called the undisputed Pauline epistles because uh, there aren't really aren't scholars who dispute these seven. I mean, every now and then someone will come along and dispute them because he has to get tenure and he's to write them. <laughs> and so, you know, he'll write something to it. But, but basically, and the, re the, lo the reason is that um, you, you have these 13 letters. Seven of them cohere together extremely well. Writing style is similar. Theological views are similar. Vocabulary used is similar. Uh, they're addressing different situations, and so there, there are a lot of differences among them, but they cohere together. As, as, a, as a group of letters that appear to be written by the same person. Um, so since all 13 of them claim to be written by Paul and you have seven that are from one person, the other six, three are written by somebody who's not the same as the seven. The other three are all written by different persons. So you've got one, two, three, four, five authors. One of the authors has the most things. And the things that are talked about in these seven appear most likely to be things that ha were happening early in Christianity rather than in later decades. And so since they all claim to be written by Paul, everybody just assumes it's Paul who was writing these. They might be wrong. It might have been someone else, but it seems plausible that it's Paul. Yeah. So when you're talking about uh, how you think that 1 Peter wasn't actually written by him, you said that, well, the New Testament says that Peter was illiterate. Yeah. But how do you know that that's Oh, yeah, well, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't base my view that Peter was illiterate on a verse in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Uh, I, I'm just pointing out that it's not just kind of some crazy, uh, liberal, wide-eyed professor at Chapel Hill who's claiming that Peter was illiterate. Uh, in fact, it was known in the ancient world that he was illiterate. 
So I don't use that as proof that he was illiterate. It's just it is interesting that the scholarly view that he's illiterate is actually something that the Bible itself says. That's that's all I mean by that. Yeah. So, yeah. In, in all of your research on um, various writings that have been forged, have you come across anything that kind of peers through the looking glass the other way, like things that are genuine that never made it into the Bible or have ah. kind of just been lost to antiquity? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. So um, there's nothing... There's nothing by the apostles that's outside of the New Testament that w that should have been put in, because because again most of these apostles couldn't write anyway. We have other letters that claim to be written by Paul outside the New Testament that all, that were certainly not written by Paul. Um, we do have orthonymous writing. By orthonymous is the word for a writing that actually is written by the guy who's claiming to, to write it. <laughs> Uh, so we do have orthonymous writings from outside the New Testament that are very valuable, um, some of which were almost included in the New Testament. Um, we have seven letters by a bishop of, of, um, of Antioch in Syria, a guy named Ignatius. Uh, seven letters written soon after the books of the New Testament. We have a... Um, we have a... We have one book that almost made it in is a very long book. It's longer than any books of the New Testament that is a kind of a revelation that's given to a guy named Hermas, the shepherd of Hermas, that even in the fourth century, some church fathers thought should be in the New Testament, but eventually it was excluded. It's probably excluded because it was just, it's just so long, and, <laughs> and it's really, frankly, a bit boring uh, that I think people just decided not to mess with it anymore. So, but there's, there's, there's nothing by an apostle that we have outside the New Testament. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you very much. I've enjoyed being with you.